first presenter today is Professor Dan Quartet. He's a professor of historical theology in the seminary, uh, former dean of the seminary. I uh, asked Martin realized that he's a professor of the <laughs> he's your job at the seminary dean. Uh, but he's going to talk to us about church unity and church governance and times of conflict. Uh, I think you have been keeping up with what's going on with the annual council and things like that. Uh, we may need to have some uh, wisdom in this area. So let's welcome Jenny Cortez. Thank you. Thank you for the honor and the privilege to be here this afternoon and uh, to make this presentation. Uh, arising out of much of my research for the last uh, 25 years or so. Well, that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is currently facing governance crises uh, is an understatement, isn't it? Uh, recent conversations over the ordination of women into ministry have highlighted major differences of understanding uh, of the role of various levels of organization uh, in the decision-making process of the church. Who decides to do what in the church? And this month, earlier, a couple of weeks ago, at the annual council held in Battle Creek, church leaders debated whether it would be appropriate, there was no debate, church leaders discussed uh, whether it would be appropriate to create a mechanism by which church entities and church leaders deemed non-compliant uh, some aspects of church governance could be held accountable in more uh, obvious ways and reprimanded if needed. The creation of these compliance committees, if you followed on social media, and their terms of reference really uh, made a lot of people angry, particularly the vast majority of Western church leaders, while it appeared to have delighted church leaders from other parts of the world. Since writing my doctoral dissertation 25 years ago, I have been studying the developments of ecclesial structures in different denominations. It is well documented that churches and denominations go through a process of institutionalization, we call it, as denominations age and as generations succeed each other. According to historians like Max Weber in Germany and H. Richard Niebuhr here in the U.S. and their studies and the paradigms of the development of church governance, a denomination usually goes through a predictable number of stages in its maturing process of institutionalization. And I see that this process is also followed by our own denomination and therefore creating the crises in which we find ourselves today. The first generation usually of a new movement tends to be very sectarian and very separatist. The pioneer generation joins a new movement by a conscious decision to leave the world or to leave something behind and they establish a system of beliefs with a sectarian impulse primarily and their doctrines are the only truths to be believed that can help someone to be saved. The second generation is born within the movement, feels less the need of a decision to join it. Their conviction have already been hammered out. Their responsibility is to be grateful and faithful to what the parents have done. The third generation comes along and decides to establish institutions to solidify the movement. Education becomes a need to keep the movement solid and effective in its perceived mission and role in the world. By the time we get to the fourth and the fifth generations of a new movement, the institutional growth of the movement has become primary. There is an increased need of good administrators and the group seeks to become relevant to society. It is now the belonging impulse that guides the group's relationship to society. This generation cares very much about what society thinks of its movement and the denomination seeks the approval of society and some integration into it. By then, the sect has become a church and its institutions need to be well received. This paradigm of institutionalization has been verified over and over with numerous Protestant denominations, particularly with American-born denominations, including us. 
Even the vocabulary that we as Adventists have used to refer to ourselves has followed this paradigm of institutionalization. At first, we called ourselves God's little flock, and then God's peculiar people, and then God's remnant people, and then God's remnant church. And now we are the Seventh-day Adventist church. So from people, movement, to church. You've got the institutionalization process going through. At first, we operated with small committees of lay people in personal homes, and our funds were given quite sacrificially. Now we operate with corporations and boards of trustees in sumptuous buildings. We seek economic stability, and our investment folio, portfolios are worth uh, billions of dollars throughout the world. So one thing to note about the Adventist experience, however, is that our evangelistic activities constantly bring new people to the community, and thus in any given church congregation at any given time, we likely have people who are first-generation Adventists worshiping along those who are multi-generation Adventists. And that creates some very interesting dynamics within the very local congregation. And the potential for conflicts and dissatisfaction between generations and hen is enhanced because each generation may have different expectations of how the church ought to relate to society and how unity ought to be understood in those settings. Not only have we followed this paradigm of institutionalization, but we have also created our own hybrid of church government. And it has slowly veered toward a more hierarchical governance structure, and thus creating our current discomfort and conflict with hierarchy and how we relate to how our church leaders are doing things. Since the beginning of Christianity, without various models of governance have described how churches function. In 1974, a Catholic theologian by the name of Avery Dulles published an important study on the typology of models of churches and described five important types of these models. The church as an institution, the church as a mystical community, as a sacrament, as herald, or as servant. The church as institution, the first one, is the model that has traditionally received more attention, and in Roman Catholic churches or Eastern Orthodox churches, the institutional model has taken the form of an Episcopal uh, polity, so bishops are in charge of the church. Since the Reformation, however, the Protestant churches have followed three main types of institutional church governance, and each one of these types is trying to understand unity in the church or in that group from a different angle and a different perspective. There is some Protestant churches who have followed an Episcopal governance structure. That's the Anglican and the Episcopal, the Lutherans, and the Methodists for the, for the basic part. And then there's a Presbyterian model, Presbyterian churches, but also all the Reformed uh, Christian churches. A lot of them are in Grand Rapids, Holland, Michigan, lots of Reformed churches in that part of our state here. And then another model is the Congregational model. That's your Baptist, your Pentecostals, your Church of Christ, the Mennonites, and so on. Our Adventist system tends to be a hybrid of all three of them, and therefore how we understand governance and unity is also a hybrid of all of those. And because it's a hybrid, these various strands within our culture is having conflicts between themselves as to how to understand what unity in the end is going to be accomplished or how it is going to be accomplished. <laughs> and so how do we see this? I don't have a whole lot of time here, so uh, I, I need to speed up a little bit. Let me go through the three models the Episcopal model. It comes from the Greek word episkopos, which means bishop. Most of the time, it is translated bishop. It basically means the bishops are in charge of the church. Uh, whether you call that person a bishop or not, that person is responsible for a group of churches in a geographical area. So usually it's called a diocese. Sometimes it may be called a conference. Uh, 
and the church leader is the one who has the authority to exercise the authority of God on earth, so to speak, in that geographical area. The bishop governs and cares for those churches. Uh, he is the overseer of that regional area. Uh, it offers a very clear understanding of organizational structure. It's a hierarchical structure. The bishop is at the top, or the council of bishops for various areas is at the top. The dominant understanding of unity in that system is very simple. Lower organizations belonging to higher organizations follow the regulations given by the higher organizations. So if a group of bishops decides a number of things, the lower organizations have to follow what the bishops have said. Since without a bishop, a local church cannot function or exist, the bishop is said to be constitutive of the church. Perfect unity is manifested very simply. You obey the bishop. You obey the church leader. You obey what the church leaders say. That's how unity is manifested, because the church leaders have been empowered by God to exercise authority on earth. Where is the authority of God on earth to be found? In the authority of the bishops. They are the ones who decide. So if we want church unity, we follow what the bishops say. Pure and simple. The Presbyterian model is the second model, particularly present among many uh, Protestant churches. Presbyterian comes from the Greek word presbyteros, translated very often as the word elder. The, a presbyteros in the, Old, in the New Testament is an elderly person, could be just a church leader, an elder. And so the Presbyterian uh, 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 governance structure has its authority in the office of the elder and in councils in which the elders meet together to make decisions. The primary church leader is the elder, whether it's a lay elder or a paid elder by the church. And in that case, that becomes a pastor usually. So you've got lay elder and, and church employee elders. And the elders are representatives of the people. And they meet together in councils. And they make decisions for the church. Where's the authority in that church structure? It is in the councils of the church. In the decisions that these committees will take, will make. The concepts undergirding the Presbyterian model is our collegiality. You all kind of are at the same level. Collaboration, lots of interdependence between various conferences, various churches, various elders and pastors. And then one more, goodwill. Lots of goodwill for that kind of a system to function. Local churches are administered by councils of elders. Each congregation belongs to a larger body called a presbytery or a conference. They meet regularly in assemblies to make decisions. Now you can tell here that our system is very keen to that. We love committees. And we call our pastors in, in, in English, in the American system, we call our pastors elders. So that's very much you know, where we are. And so in these councils and in these assemblies, that's where the will of God is expressed and the Lordship of Jesus is manifested. How is unity manifested in a Presbyterian system? By the goodwill of the people to follow what the committees decide. Because the committees cannot impose it on lower congregations. The low, lower congregations, out of goodwill, must follow what the councils decide. Congregational systems, that's the Baptist and the Pentecostals. Uh, the local congregation is in charge. The authority stops at the local congregation. Uh, the elders, the deacons, the pastors of the local congregations meet together. They decide on their doctrines. They decide how much to pay the pastor. They decide on what church building they'll have. They decide what to do with their tithe. It's all at the local level. If they belong to a larger association, like the Southern Baptist Convention, for example, uh, then it is a fellowship type of association. The convention cannot tell the local congregation what to do, because each local congregation is independent and decide what it is going to be done at that local level. So let's come, about, let's come to the Adventist system. The Seventh-day Adventist organization is a hybrid of all three of them. 
of all three models all together. And yet, here's my point here that I want to get at here this afternoon. I believe that the Episcopal system, similar to the United Methodist Church in the United States, for example, is the dominant model in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And that is why now it is causing us some problems. It is because we have not admitted that we have a predominant Episcopal system. We don't have bishops. We called our leaders elders or presidents of conferences, of unions, of divisions, of the GC. But they really function as bishops without the title of bishop. Let me explain. The Episcopal model is the dominant one in our governance structure with its organization into conferences and hierarchical authority structure that we have with a general conference. The Adventist conference resembles the diocese of Episcopal churches and the conference president, although not called or even ordained as a bishop, exercises many of the functions of an Episcopal bishop. The fact that presidents of the various hierarchical bodies within our church, the conference, the union, the division, the general conference, can serve an unlimited number of terms is a mark of an Episcopal church governance. The, governance, the conference owns church properties and also appoints and ordains pastors within local churches. That is a mark of an Episcopal church governance. Another mark of Episcopalism is the adoption of fundamental beliefs by the highest organizational level. For us, it's a general conference in session, which is often understood as the voice of God on earth, as the highest authority, and that sounds very Episcopal, if just in the way it is said. Church policies are adopted at higher levels and required compliance at lower levels. The systems of checks and balances between the various levels is highly efficient and well-designed, and compliance with policies and regulations is fundamental to unity, to visible unity. All of these are marks of an Episcopal system of church governance. Methodist and Adventist governance functions with representative assemblies made up of pastors and lay people and is less focused on the role and function of one person, that's the mark of the Protestant pro pro priesthood of all believers, but notice, those of you who have been on any committees at any level, please notice that the agenda and the documents discussed at all Adventist assemblies of our higher organizations, conference, annual councils, division year and meetings, general conference session, whatever they may be, the agendas and the documents to be discussed are prepared by the leaders of the church with very little input by lay people and non-employed church people. That is a mark of an Episcopal church governance. Thus, the roles of Adventist church leaders are strangely akin to those of Episcopal bishops, but we, call, we don't call them that way. According to our church manual, that may surprise you, it usually surprises all of my pastor in training, all the students I have in my classes when I give this list here. According to our church manual, the conference president is responsible for the oversight of all pastors and all churches within the conference. He stands, quote here, the head of the gospel ministry in the conference and is the chief elder and overseer, that's another translation of the word bishop in the New Testament, by the way, of all the churches. He works for their spiritual welfare and counsels them regarding their activities and plans. End of quotation here from the church manual. Uh, you know, anybody in the Episcopal system of church governance who read this sentence would say, well, that's what a bishop is supposed to do in our church. Continuing, the role of a conference president, he, he has access to all congregations' meetings, record books, and reports. He should be present at the organization and dissolving of any congregations. In the absence of a pastor, the conference president gives permission for a lay elder to baptize new members, preside over the Lord's Supper, and perform marriage ceremonies. When a person seeks to join the Seventh-day Adventist Church by profession of faith, rather than by baptism, the conference president should be consulted ahead of time to give his approval. And the president also authorizes non-Adventist speakers in local churches. All of these 
are from the church manual. All of these roles of the conference president are in the church manual of our church. Those are all bishop responsibilities in an Episcopal form of church governance. Surprising, isn't it? Ordination in the Adventist church is also displaying some Episcopal uh, characteristics. If you have ever attended an ordination of a pastor, you may have noticed that only ordained pastors come forward to lay hands on this new pastor who is going to be ordained. That's a kind of, of a form of Episcopal succession that the ancient churches are practicing. Also, we have three levels of ordination in our church. Deacons, elders, and pastors, different ordination for each one of them. And each one of them is hierarchical. The elder is superior to the deacon, and the pastor is superior to the elder and the deacon. For example, if a pastor has never served as a deacon, and at his retirement, this pastor wants to be the deacon of a local congregation. This pastor does not need to be ordained as a deacon because his ordination as a pastor is superior to that of a deacon or an elder. Hierarchical ordination. That's all Episcopal. <laughs> it's not Presbyterian. It's not congregational either. What else can I say? Uh, upward remuneration scales in our church system. A pastor has one scale, a conference president, a higher scale, a union president, higher scale, and so on. I mean, as you go into the hierarchy, the, the, the salary goes up as well. That's all Episcopal. At, at least it's a very strong hierarchical form of church governance. All right. And I think this is why we're having conflicts at the moment. So while the Seventh-day Adventist governance structure reflects some Presbyterian and some congregational characteristics in the way we do committees, the interdependence we have, the checks and the balances, the involvement of lay people in all of our committees and in the governance, the roles and the functions of our leaders, however, along with the understanding of a very strong hierarchy, all of that is Episcopal. So there's a distant dissonance here. The dissonance is significant in our system. Adventist lay people think they're involved in a Presbyterian governance structure, while our church leaders function in an Episcopal church structure. And that alone affects how unity is perceived. Lay people understand unity, therefore, as being consensus, talking to each other, deciding together what we're going to do and how we're going to run our church. That's the Presbyterian system. We all talk and the lay people have just as much of a voice as the leaders do. But in the Episcopal system, the leaders decide how church unity is going to be done. The leaders prepare the agenda and the leaders prepare the document and the lay people are asked to acquiesce to these documents. There is dissonance in our church system because of that. So our current strains, therefore, I think arise of the fact, out of the fact, that we have not realized that we've got these various strands in our governance structure and now they're being very much in conflict. And this conflict here, therefore, is really on the horizon. Will it lead to schism among Seventh-day Adventists? Can we survive such conflicts that, that we're having at the moment given the fact that these various strands of a governance are clashing with each other within our structure. Our current tensions uh, between a centralized authority and a decentralized authority, so Episcopal versus Presbyterian here, is nothing new. In 1901 and 1903, in our history, a hundred and some years ago, the centralization of authority in the General Conference was did was implemented uh, when various semi-independent ministries of the church became departments of the general conference and, and local conferences. The same executive committee now would provide leadership in the management or in oversight of all kinds of ministries within our region. Yet at the same time, this centralized authority was 
counterbalanced with the creation of union conferences with their own semi-independent boards and constituencies. And all of the unions together would form the general conference. So there was a check and balance created a hundred and some years ago. But over time, the General Conference Executive Committee has reclaimed much of the authority that the creation of union conferences was intended to diffuse, such as the creation of divisions and so on. And over time, a more hierarchical and episcopal system uh, came to predominate in our church since at least uh, the last half of the 20th century. Where is all this leading us? Let me come perhaps to a conclusion here. Is a schism inevitable in our church? No, it's not inevitable. If we take advantage of the best features of our ecclesiology, one of the assets of our hybrid system, of all these three systems being knitted together, so to speak, uh, one of the assets of our hybrid, of Episcopal, also is our common belief in a single mission and that has been a very strong antidote to schism. But preventing a schism or even a large exodus of members, which by the way has really started, will require action from our dominant centralized Episcopal structure. And we need, I think, to re-embrace the important Presbyterian and Congregationalist aspects of our history. Let me give five suggestions as I end. From my study, from all that conversations and listening, five, five suggestions that I think would prevent a schism in our church. First one is contrary to the actions of annual councils that we've had in the last couple years, some church entities would benefit from less rigid ties with our general conference structure. And I don't think we need to be afraid of that. We need, we need to re-embrace uh, decentralization like we did in 1901-1903. Adventism can remain within one worldwide structure as long as we understand that true unity is first a spiritual unity of common mission and belief, not just a visible unity within an organizational structure. Goodwill, in other words, is very important here. Trying to impose visible unity by means of policies has always been counterproductive. Loosening these ties will require wisdom, trust, and generosity. But I believe that in the end, it would actually strengthen our mission and our ministry just to decentralize things one more time, to not be so gung-ho on having a hierarchy and those at the top decide everything that needs to be done. A second suggestion, we can remain within one visible worldwide structure if we decentralize ecclesial authority enough so that all church policies are subject to cultural and local accommodation. In contrast to fundamental beliefs which are held by all church members, church policies are the practical application of rules and standards that vary from country to country, from culture to culture, and over time. The organizational model of the General Conference is best seen as a federation of semi-independent union conferences that are best equipped to apply the rules, the policies, the standards of the church within their cultures and their local traditions. If Adventists see themselves as having one special mission to communicate the special end time message to all the world, then how this is done and by whom can be decided by local entities. Such details need not be imposed by administrators who live and function in a different world, which was in fact the major reason for the creation of union conferences in 1901. Third suggestion, for the sake of unity in Christ, based on our understanding of the priesthood of all believers, which is a very strong impulse in the Presbyterian and the Congregationalist systems of governance that is part of our hybrid, we need to reappraise our understanding of what it means to be an ordained elder or an ordained pastor in our church. And I speak as one here. At the heart of our understanding of the gospel is the message that church leaders are not to be masters, 
but rather to be servants of the people. It is natural in an Episcopal form of church governance for church leaders to become more authoritative and to wield more and more authority. It's natural for this to happen, just like it's happening right now. Hierarchical upward mobility is perceived as a blessing of God. That natural tendency must be checked, I believe. We should consider seriously the value of term limits on our church leadership at all levels, something that is done in the Presbyterian system. Presbyterian church leaders are elected for one or two terms, and when they're done, they go back to do pastoral ministry. Fourth, fourth suggestion, because of the Protestant principle of the priesthood of all believers will often create tension within a hierarchical Episcopal church structure. We need to rethink the role of our church leaders. The title of president held by our top leaders is functionally a synonym for bishop, given their roles and their functions, and the way they act also perhaps sometimes. That title assumes authoritative roles and functions. Should we reconsider that our presidents do what they do and reshape our administrative structure to give them the role of moderator or general secretary instead? Well, that would be just an earth-shaking change here, but, <laughs> but such a change would transform the dynamics of our committees and councils and require certainly a rewrite of church manuals and policies, but it would immediately add value to the voice of lay people on these committees and would enhance the servanthood principle of our leadership positions. If we truly believe in the priesthood of all believers, then lay people need to be there when the agenda is prepared and when the documents are prepared. Last. The most important spiritual gifts needed by church leaders in an Episcopal system at risk of schism, like we're facing, are humility, gentleness, meekness, servanthood, and repentance. Well, may God grant these gifts of His Spirit to all of us as we discuss what we're going to do in our church next. And I pray that the Holy Spirit may guide our church leaders in all kinds of divisions throughout the world who in the next four or five weeks are going to meet to discuss what they're going to do next. May they, get, may they have the wisdom that they need to do that. Thank you for your attention.